Okay, good evening, everybody. We're uh, drawing to a close of day one. Uh, welcome back into this room, the audience here. Welcome, everybody watching at home, live streaming. This is the uh, evening keynote conversation. If you feel like using social media, the hashtag is HC Berlin for Twitter or at, I can't say this without sounding weird, at Humcon Berlin, H U M C O N Berlin, Hum Humcon Berlin, there you go. Uh, this evening we're going to hear from two people uh, who will give us uh, their experiences on the front lines of action, so to speak. Uh, the conversation this evening is really going to dwell on the criminalization of uh, environmental defenders and also humanitarian aid and where the intersection lies what we can explore and dwell on shared experiences and what the shared responsibility now is, particularly with the climate crisis that you've been hearing about today. Um, so without uh, any more introduction than that, you will firstly hear from, uh, secondly, we'll hear from Carola Raquette, who is an ecologist by training. In 20, since 2011, she's been on polar research climate science uh, 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 vessels. Uh, and since 2016 uh, began volunteering with search and rescue services in the Mediterranean, both in the air and on the sea. And in summer this year uh, became the focus of headlines around a moment in Lampedusa in June about which you'll hear. But firstly, we'll hear from Phyllis, Phyllis Omido. Phyllis uh, was working, at, by your own words, you say, as an employee, uh, commissioning environmental impact studies but uh, found herself on the other side of that and got interested in issues to do with lead poisoning in the vicinity of where, where she worked in, in Mombasa and established a, a center for justice, governance, and environmental action about which we'll hear more about, I'm sure. So Phyllis, take us away. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so as you've heard, my name is Phyllis Omido. Uh, I'm Kenyan. I'm Luya by tribe. That is, uh, Kenya has uh, several tribes. And uh, my tribe is Luya. We are known for a lot of uh, cultural practices. Uh, and I've grown up really in the village in Kenya. Um, my favorite thing always was to stay in nature. I grew up climbing trees, um, and I was very naughty from a young age, always trying to challenge the culture and tradition of my people. When I was told that women could not eat certain parts of the chicken, I would always make sure I tested it and told my dad about it, <laughs> just <laughs> so I could get uh, his reaction from it. Um, and so I grew up that way from a younger age. My mom was a teacher in our village school and um, we grew up understanding uh, simplicity of life. We drank from the river at home, we ate fruits from the trees. Uh, but unfortunately, at some point, my mother passed away and I had to leave home. I went to the town so that I could get further educated by my aunties who were in the city. And in the city, I was a village girl, but uh, I tried to learn my ways very fast. But uh, I did not understand the ways of the city boys. And I ended up a single mom to a boy. <laughs> uh, and after I got my son, I knew that I had to work harder I knew that uh, I needed to give him a better life than I had. Um, I had siblings at home because um, I'm one of four, and my sister and two brothers were also expecting me to do uh, my best in the city so that I could also assist them, uh, get them through ed education, um, and give them a chance in life as well. So um, I wasn't going to waste this privilege that I had. And so I started working in the corporate world, and I worked really hard to climb up the corporate ladder. Um, in 2009, I saw an advert uh, in the papers, and I applied for this job. 
uh, for a new company that was advertised, that was bringing in uh, new technology to Kenya and transferring skills and creating jobs for us. And of course, I was happy to accept this job. Um, and I worked really hard, knowing uh, what was expected of me by society. And um, shortly into my job, in uh, around three months into my job, my, my son fell ill. Uh, he fell horribly, horribly ill, and it started me a journey of trying to find out what was wrong with my son. And um, he was tested for all kinds of tropical diseases, malaria, typhoid, you know, uh, rotavirus. And the doctors just simply could not find out what was wrong with him. Um, we got, I got really terrified because then in a month into the sickness, he was admitted in hospital and the doctor says he was in critical condition. They had to put him on a constant drip uh, because he was dehydrated. His fevers were not subsiding. Um, so as is our culture in Africa, when you are sick, people will visit you in hospital. And one of my friends actually who worked for government visited me in hospital. I had worked within corporate, uh, the corporate world for almost five years. And of course, I had interacted a lot with these uh, government officers, and they respected me very much. Some had become my friends. And so one of them visited me in hospital. And he said, uh, Phyllis, have you thought of uh, testing your, ch your child for chemical disease? I said, which chemical disease? He said, lead poisoning. I said, why? He told me you should consider testing him for lead poisoning. Um, so I called my pediatrician and asked if she could do that. And she said, um, I don't think that's an issue here in Kenya. And I said, no, um, I've been advised, and I think the advice is good, so we should test. It started me a journey of trying to get my son tested for lead poisoning. And that, uh, that was really shocking to me because all the hospitals in Mombasa did not have uh, the capacity to test for lead poisoning. I finally landed into a private pathology lab uh, who advised me that they had to airlift my son's blood to South Africa, which they did. And seven days later, I got the results and uh, my son had tested positive for lead poisoning. Um, I left with those results and went to my pediatrician and she looked at me and said, Phyllis, I've never dealt with such a case. I don't know what to do. Um, and that was for me very horrifying for my doctor to tell me that she didn't know how to treat my child. I started looking for doctors the whole of Mombasa and all of them told me they could not, they couldn't help me, they didn't know what to do. Um, I was very blessed because one of my relatives had lived in the U.S. for long, so um, we contacted her, and she started a journey of assisting me um, deal with the lead poisoning. So after my son stabilized um, and was sent back home uh, from hospital, I went back to my workplace and had it in my resignation and went to the neighboring community because where I worked um, was separated by a wall a community was separated by a wall. That community is called the Winohuru community. It's a village of 3,000 people, 800 of whom are children. And I went into the community because uh, I knew that where I worked, the, the, the pollution, what was called the pollution plant, was right in front of that community. And because of the direction of the wind, all the smoke, would be blown into the community. So I went and spoke to a few members of the community and requested that they give me three children to go and test for lead poisoning. And they very graciously accepted, and I went and took those three children, and their blood work came back a week later. All three tested positive for lead poisoning. Um, I took these results, four of them, and this started me a journey of trying to find out um, whether government would assist us. And I went from 
office to office uh, of these people that were my friends for so many years, these people that always did what I asked when I was in the corporate world. But for the first time, um, doors were not open to me anymore. Uh, doors were closed. Uh, my friends stopped responding to me. Um, and this, for me, was very strange because something really was wrong, and I had proof, uh, or I thought that I did, that something really was wrong and needed to be investigated further. I wrote letters uh, to the National Environmental Management Authority, to the Ministry of Public Health, and I enclosed this letter. And I remember NEMA, the Na National Environmental Management Authority, wrote back to me and said, we are strangers to these allegations, and if you decide to act on them, we will sue. And this was very strange to me because I told you something is wrong and you needed to investigate. Um, I went back to the community and explained to these uh, other women that their children were sick and that I have tried to get intervention from government, but they don't seem interested, interested in helping me. And these women, um, were also very concerned about their children and told me we can't leave it at that. How did you treat your child? Um, and I couldn't really help them because I had only gotten help also. So it was hard for me to tell uh, the people who had helped me, I have more people that I need you to help. So my only advice was we need to get government to help us. We need to get uh, the people responsible to treat us. This, um, I thought, would be an easy job. Uh, that was in 2009. This is 2019, and I'm still on it, <laughs> trying to get them to act. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, when I realized that it wasn't as easy as when I was in the corporate world, people were not going to act, I decided to mobilize community action. And I went door to door to all 800 households in Ogunohuru, and I explained to them why they needed to take time off work, and that we needed to march as a group to um, send the message out to government that we needed help. And so I organized the first demo in 2010, um, and when, when, the, when the newspapers uh, heard about our demo, they all came. Very early in the morning, we, were, we got uh, newspaper cov uh, television coverage and newspaper coverage. And the, the, assist the then assistant minister for environment called and said uh, he was on his way and we should stop the demonstrations. So we waited for him to come. But when he came to address us, he came in the company of uh, one uh, of the owners of this uh, uh, smelter that we suspected had poisoned us. So there wasn't much we could do. I tried to lift up the results that I had in my paper, but I was clobbered. Uh, he had bodyguards around him, and he told them, beat that girl up. So I ended up uh, jumping on a motorbike and escaped that one time. <laughs> Uh, the second time, um, because there was no action and the pollution was getting really bad, they were now doing it so openly. Um, what was happening is that they would import used lead acid batteries from all, all around the world, and this would be cleaned up in Kenya, and the waste left in Kenya, and then the pure lead, 99% uh, pure lead would be exported out of Kenya. Um, so I asked the community that we should march again in 2012 because the situation had become so bad that the community, the women in the community now could not carry their children to term. As at now, we've counted uh, almost 300 uh, uh, deaths, which included uh, miscarriages. There are women who miscarried four, five times trying to get pregnant, and some of them, their wombs had to be removed. We had children that uh, lost their lives, that died from, from uh, very heavy contamination. WHO defines lead poisoning at five micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. 
the highest in Ounohuru is at 420 micrograms of lead per deciliter of lead. She survives by a miracle. Her thyroid has given in. The one, uh, there are many who have had uh, maybe 200 who have already died from it. Um, and so this time I was very determined that we would get government action on it. And the constitution of Kenya gives us the right to pick it. So I said, let's do this. And I wrote to the police and told them we need protection because we are coming out to demo. And that morning, uh, I woke up very early. I went into the community and woke everyone up. We made tea um, in front of the playground. And by around 6 a.m., we were ready to go um, to take our petition to government. And that morning, um, as I spoke to the community and advised them on how we were going to split up, which offices we were going to, which letters were going to which office, I heard a loud bang. And there was smoke all over, and there was tear gas. And there was, what I could hear was, uh, where is she, where is that woman, where is that woman? So I put my hands up and said, I'm here. I'm here because I was worried because there were children on the play playground who had been tear gassed. The police, there was a multi-agency contingent of policemen. There were lorries of policemen poured everywhere. And when finally uh, one heard me say, yeah, this is me, he, he called the others and said, she's here. I was dragged from Owinohuru to the main road. Uh, my shoes disappeared somewhere along the way. Um, and then I was made to sit on the main road in the puddle uh, of, of water. And the police then went into the community and went house to house, breaking into their houses, pouring out the food uh, of the community members. And people ran. The community members ran. The brave ones, I remember there were 16 people who refused to move. They came and sat down on the road with me. And they were clobbered, but they refused to move. They stayed um, on the road with me. And I was there on the road holding my placard up, saying sentenced to death. And the media caught it up, and it was all over the news. And um, the police said they were waiting for instructions. So I sat down there for almost three hours. After that, I was thrown at the back of a police van, handcuffed, and taken to the cells. Um, I had not planned to be arrested, <laughs> so I didn't have a, a plan of how I would get out. Uh, <laughs> so I scribbled my brother's number on, 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 a, on a paper and gave one of the journalists who was following the case and said, call my brother, tell him that um, I'm in the cells. And my brother came, my elder brother, and he told me that he'd been threatened also. I said, who threatened you? He said, I don't know, but someone from the police told me that I should be careful, that what you are doing is wrong. And they have refused to give you bail because they said you are a suspected terrorist. <laughs> and my brother was shocked. And, and he asked what charges um, they were bringing against me. And they said that I was funding an illegal group uh, and when my brother told me, I said, okay, that's good, because I was broke anyway. <laughs> Let them try and prove that. <laughs> so I think at night, um, the first charges that had brought, they had brought against me could not stand. So I was brought out of the cells at night. I was really terrified at around 2 a.m. Um, to sign another charge sheet. And they said they had decided to change the charges against me. And they, this time they were charging me with inciting violence and illegal gathering. Um, as I slept uh, in that dirty uh, police cell, I was intimidated. I was made to take out uh, people, other people's uh, uh, feces and, and urine just, just to be intimidated. I, I thought about my son and the fact that he was, he had, no one to care for him at home, and I was worried about him. And uh, at that moment, I said, um, I, I, maybe I made a mistake, and maybe it's time for me to stop this and just take care of my son. Um, 
and I cried and I woke up the next day. Uh, I was actually woken up at around 4 a.m. and I was bundled into the police van again. But when I was coming out of the police, uh, I asked, where am I being taken? They said, we are taking you to court to be charged. And when I came out, the, almost the whole of Owinohuru community, thousands of them, had slept outside the police, the police compound. And they had waited for me. And when I was coming out, I screamed and held my hand and said, I'm going now. I'm going to, to the courthouse. And because it's a very poor community, it's, it's people that earn around $3 a day. They didn't have money to 50 shillings to pay from where we were in Changamo to Mombasa town. And so they walked all the way. And by 9 AM, when I was arraigned in court, the courtroom was full of, of the Winohuru community. And I think that's the day that my mind was solidified that I was an activist. That is the, <laughs> that is the day that I, Fear left me, and I looked at, at the judge, and I was ready to face whatever came, um, came my way. Um, from that time, um, I left. Uh, I, was, I was given a very high bail. And remember, there were 16 other people charged with me, and all of them were given this very high bail that we, we couldn't really afford. Um, the purpose was that we would not be able to pay and end up being taken to, to a remand. Um, but my brother was there and he rushed, he did everything in his power and he raised bail for all 16 of us and he paid. And we were able to go home uh, that evening. And when I got home, m my son had seen me on TV. Um, and he asked, Mom, Mom, are you a bad person? I said, no, I'm not a bad person. <laughs> are the police bad people? I said, no, Papa, the police are not bad people. So if you're not bad and the police are not bad, why did they arrest you? <laughs> and uh, these are some of the things that made me understand that I would not stop doing this. Um, I would continue doing this until my son was proud of me. And I'm really glad that he's here with me today. <laughs> and, and I'm sure now that he's, he knows that, uh, he knows the answer to that question, that in this life you must pay a price for what you believe in and you must stand up uh, for what is right and what your conscience tells you is right. And that's what I have been doing. I have uh, now documented uh, it in a book. I cannot be able to tell everything, but yesterday we, la we launched this at the Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, which is the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and uh, I'm hoping now, we were able to shut down the metal refinery in 2014. Not because government shut it down, but because we were determined. And when they refused to shut it down, we went through the East African community, passed a law, and managed to shut this melter down and remove the source of exposure to lead for the Winohuru community. We are now in court. <laughs> We are now in court where I have sued uh, six state agencies and two uh, corporations uh, for poisoning the Winohuru community. And uh, what I'm asking is that they clean the environment and restore it to what it was before, because the, the community had clean rivers where the people would drink free water from. They had wells that are now polluted. The playground is polluted. And I'm asking also that they give treatment to the 3,000 members of the Winohuru community and compensate those that have suffered loss of life and other health and environment damages in the community. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening. Thank you. Phyllis, thank you very much. We've got, um, we'll have time to talk 
after Carola gives us a little bit of, of her background too, but thank you for that inspiring uh, speech there, Phyllis. Yeah, well, um, welcome to everyone here. I'm really thankful that you're here to listen to me and Phyllis. That was such a courageous story. Um, I don't think my story is even half as interesting, but I had to make notes for myself because I'm not used to any public speaking, really. Um, because, interestingly, um, I'm an ecologist by training. Most of you have now heard my name in the recent months as having been the captain of a sea rescue vessel. And now, strangely enough, my life sometimes gets condensed to exactly 21 days. And that is still something I have to get used to a little bit. So um, there's really nothing very special about me at all. Um, after I finished high school, I went to Maritime University and I thought, well, I'm going to become a navigator because, well, I don't know, I don't want to work in an office, I want to go very far away, um, whatever, I didn't really know what it meant, so I started to do navigation. And by chance, I was very lucky to get a job on the German research icebreaker right after I finished university. So from 2011 onwards, I've been working in, mainly in polar research, and that was also in 2011, for the first time I was on the North Pole. And I realized, well, there isn't that much ice there as I always thought there should be. <laughs> and I was talking to the scientists, and there were climate scientists there who had been going to the Central Arctic for 20 and 30 years, and they said like, well, within our lifetime, the ice here, not even only the extent, but particularly the thickness, is reducing tremendously, and we are extremely worried. And that was my first, my first time at work, really. And working with them, I then realized what we're needing is not so much maybe scientific facts, what we need is more political action. And for that reason, at some point, I decided to go and uh, start working for Greenpeace for a change. I was on the Arctic sunrise. And then suddenly, in, um, I decided that's still not enough. I want to study nature conservation. I want to get out in nature. I really want to do something practical and so on. But um, doing all that part-time studies at the same time, a friend of Greenpeace said to me, you know what? There's now so many people crossing the Mediterranean Sea, so many refugees, and they need people with licenses, shipping licenses, um, to help out there. And I thought, yeah, well, why not? I'll go and help out for a bit. And that was in 2016. That was the first time that I started to volunteer for Sea-Watch, and I think now it's time that I talk a little bit about what the recent history of the sea rescue in the Mediterranean is. I had, over the time, interesting conversations. I remember, for example, a journalist from Reuters who was telling me, well, I document migration through the Mediterranean Sea for already 20 years. He was from Spain, so you all know there have, has been times where people went to the Canaries, where people um, tried to go through the uh, Street of Gibraltar, but now at that time we are 2015-16 um, mainly looking at people coming through the central Mediterranean Sea that is because uh, Libya is at a civil war and for the smugglers it's comparatively easy to route people from there and mainly aimed at Italy and at Malta so a lot of people were trying to cross and they were dying and um, that has been a huge tragedy also for the Italian people in particular, the fishermen, also the local people on islands like Lampedusa who saw people drowning right in front of their shores. And then the Italian state decided to help. In 2014, they started a program called Mar Nostrum, Our Seas, to help um, and send the Coast Guard. And then something very unfortunate happened, which was that none of the other European states really wanted to help them fund the project. So after one year, they skipped it and they said, we don't have the money, it's too expensive, and none of the other states wanted to help them. So that was the moment when, for example, Sea-Watch, the organization I was volunteering, but also other organizations, also MSF, Save the Children, and other ones, um, smaller civilian organizations started to step in and filled in that gap of state actors because actually sea rescue is something to be carried out by the state authorities. It's not actually a job for civil society, 
that every captain which finds somebody in distress, similar to you seeing a car accident maybe on the road, you have to help. And that's how it went on in 2015-16. Um, the EU military mission, Sofia was still there. Some Frontex border vessels were there, both with the aim of actually preventing smuggling and closing the border down. But if they would see someone drown, they would also engage in the rescue. And that was a very weird combination of actors out in the Mediterranean Sea, and it went on for a while. But then more and more people became concerned about the amount of immigrants coming to Europe, even though at the highest time we were still looking at very small numbers relatively to the European population, less than 1% even. So really a small amount of people at all. But the public opinion was changing a little bit. And for me, a big mark in, in all that happening was a case of a ship called the Juventa in 2017. It was a ship operated by a small German NGO. And they, um, they were seized. They were arrested from one day to the other in an Italian port. And it was said that they were, in fact, a criminal organization. And they were accused under the mafia law for smuggling people. And that is something very, very severe, because when you're accused under mafia law, it means that you have to prove that you are innocent. It's not the state which has to prove it, it's you. So their investigation is still going on two years later. Their, their ship is still seized. And from that moment onwards, the tides really started to turn against the civilian sea rescue. More and more laws came in. It was made more and more difficult including also for the aircraft which had operated. And they are the eyes on the sea really helping to, to spot the little boats in distress. Um, new regulations were found to prevent the aircraft from starting. New regulations were made up for the ships requiring further safety equipment or this or that. Or um, when you had rescued people, um, the governments would keep you in the port for investigation, the prosecutor would come and send investigators. So it was all becoming more and more difficult over time, um, already leading up to the rescue mission that I took part in this June 2019. So um, I was actually not planning to go on this mission. I was happily in Scotland planting some trees when, when someone emailed me and said, well, you know, a captain just stepped down and we're looking for somebody who can go for three weeks and take the ship. And I was like, trees, people, trees, people. OK, let's save the people. <laughs> um, and somebody else will plant the trees, hopefully. <laughs> so of course, I went. And we went out to sea. Uh, after a few days, we rescued. 53 people, and the so-called Libyan Coast Guard had the coordination for the rescue. And they told us that we should bring the people back to Libya. Of course, we can not accept that. I, as a captain, could never bring people back to Libya, because that would be breaking the Geneva Convention on Refugee Rights. Because Libya is a country at civil war, and the human rights abuses in Libya are extremely well documented, we know of um, really very systematic kidnappings, torture, sexual abuse, forced labor, and really all types of horrible things I cannot even imagine. Um, so it's, there have been many court cases which are saying that you cannot bring people to Libya. It doesn't have a safe port. And since the rescue at sea is only concluded when you bring people to a safe port, we had to go somewhere else. So looking on a map, we had to go to the island of Lampedusa, which belongs to Italy, and that's where we went. And that's where we started to ask um, the European states to let the people in. And um, something interesting happened then. It was a year that the Italian ministry had decided to close the ports, that they didn't want any new arrivals coming to Italy, but a German city had declared on the, second, on the second day that they were willing to take in all the 53 people. So actually, um, there, was, there was no problem there. They said, we are even going to take a bus, send it to Italy, and we're going to pick up the people and bring them straight to Germany. 
Well, you all probably know that we were waiting 17 days. So unfortunately, what happened was that the Interior Ministry of Germany didn't allow for the people to be transshipped, and the Interior Ministry of Italy also didn't want it. So even though there is this very, very strong grass movement of solidarity in Germany, it's called Seebrücke, in the end there were 60 cities willing to take in refugees. We were still stranded outside the territorial waters of Italy with no permission for transshipment and no authorization to get in. Meanwhile, the medical condition of the people was getting worse and worse, and you are probably aware that um, in the end, I did break the law um, of the Italian ministry and did get into the port in compliance with the international law, which says the rescue is completed in a port of safety. So after... <clears throat> Yeah, thanks very much. So, unfortunately, due to, the <laughs> due to the inaction of the European governments and despite cities being willing to take in the people, um, I had to break the law. And that shows what is um, really the problem here. Um, there's border externalization going on at the moment. It's not only that we are criminalized for helping people, it's also that the EU has taken out all their own rescue assets. That means basically the ships. Um, the EU mission SOFIA stopped this year in March. Uh, Frontex, the border agency, doesn't operate any ships anymore. They only operate drones now. And the EU still operates aircraft. And while they say that they will never be bringing people back to Libya and no EU uh, authority vessel has ever brought people back to Libya, nor to Tunisia, their aircraft are constantly communicating with the so-called Libyan Coast Guard, informing them about the position of boats, and even sometimes directing them towards the boats, so that then the Libyan Coast Guard will um, bring the people who are trying to flee from Libya back to that country at civil war and back to these detention centers where we and all the EU authorities are so well aware which human rights abuses they're suffering. And that is the current status of our border externalization with Libya. And you're of course aware of what is happening between um, Turkey and Greece as well. The EU is really dealing with all types of people and governments as long as they achieve their aim, which seems to be to keep people out at all cost, breaking whatever human rights they must. They do not really care. They're totally complicit in these human rights abuses. So then there is uh, something which I call the EU Criminalization Directive. Uh, you're probably aware, but there is a directive within the EU legislation which doesn't make any difference between somebody who is helping someone out of solidarity or humanitarian reasons and someone who is smuggling. So um, while I was being criminalized, I'm really not the only person. There was a report from, I think, spring this year, there's about 160 individual people within the EU being criminalized for helping migrants and refugees. That could be um, helping them to cross a border, could be a sea border, could be a land border, could be housing them, could be giving shelter, could be um, even giving them food or whatever. Uh, it really depends. There's cases in Italy, there's cases in Greece, France, they're everywhere. This is a very, very systematic criminalization of aid going on. But being criminalized more than the helpers, of course, are the refugees themselves. They're often prevented from even asking or being able to ask for asylum when they uh, make it to the EU. They're often criminalized. For example, in Greece, there are many cases against uh, people who are 
supposedly are smugglers because for they, for example, they drove uh, the little boats, the dinghies. So if you have 20 people in a boat and one was driving, they're saying you are the smuggler. And there are hundreds of these people in, um, in jail in Greece. They often don't understand the legal processes. They don't have media attention. They don't have lawyers. They don't have money. Um, there is, for example, a Syrian student. He has been jailed or for 315 years in Greece. And there's also um, cases of three teenagers in Italy who, um, who were rescued by a tanker vessel which wanted to bring the people back to Libya. The case was called El Hiblu after the name of the tanker. The um, people on board the ship, of course, didn't want to disembark back to Libya and they forced the captain to bring them to Europe. And these three teenagers who actually acted as the um, interpreters and were therefore allowed to be in the bridge with the captain because they were the least scary to the captain, um, they now got charged for actually kidnapping and hijacking the vessel in Italy. So really, um, I receive a lot of media attention, but that is, to my feeling, plainly wrong. It's these people we have to look at. They, they are forced to leave their homes, and they really face the worst repression and criminalization anyone could imagine. So yeah, I will try to make it short now because I've, I've been speaking longer than I saw. I have more to say than I saw I would have. All right. Um, so really, we have a solidarity crisis. When we talk about a migrant crisis, we don't have that. We have a solidarity crisis within the European Union uh, for distributing refugees and migrants, but we also have a much more global solidarity crisis um, looking at the reasons why people are even forced to leave their homes and then what worries me uh, mostly, and what you have been talking about all day, of course, is the environmental breakdown. That's the future. That's what's happening already now. And that, for me, includes the climate crisis. We know that it's going to intensify. I think the report of Philip Alston from the UN has been mentioned today several times. Poverty is on the rise due to the environmental breakdown. Um, more people will lose access to food, water, shelter, education, health and so on. The environmental breakdown is going to hit the poorest the most, and it is already starting now. And that, of course, will massively increase forced migration and displacement. Of course, first and foremost, in the poor states where we already see it now, like Bangladesh, the Zal zone, and so on. But also think about even within the EU. Might be places on the coast of the Netherlands, might be places in the coast of the UK. It could be places which are hit by drought in Spain, for example. But we will see this intensifying all around the globe. And then when I think of the future, I see basically two options. And there's the option which severely worries me, and that's the option of ecofascism. That is people who in the end understand the far right, who understand that the climate crisis is real, that the environmental breakdown is real, and who will impose even worse border policies than we have now. And we had two shooters in this year, the guy in El Paso in the US and in Christchurch, who said they were killing people, they're killing foreigners for ecological reasons. And that is something I think we have to be very, very aware of. As Germans, of course, we, we have had our lecture in history that not everyone who cares about ecology is a good person. We should really know that. And we should watch out for that uh, connection in the future. And I think the other version is hopefully there's going to be a transformation. That's my great hope. A redistribution of wealth and power. Maybe even the uh, industrial nations might pay their ecological debt. Who knows? Maybe they might um, welcome refugees and migrants. And maybe, for example, Germany, the fourth biggest polluter, which was there looking at historic emissions, maybe they should take, according to their share, the people forced to leave their homes. Thank you.
well done. Okay. I mean, I feel like we want, I want about two hours with both of you now after all of that. That's fantastic from the pair of you. I mean, we did start about 10 minutes late, so we will go about 10 minutes late, if that's okay, everybody. Just to at least have an hour, as was billed. Um, and you're very clappy, which is great. So we'll, 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 have a, we'll give each other a round of applause at the end. Um, I'm going to come, uh, Phyllis, just a couple of quick questions and uh, to one separate question to each of you, and then I'll, and then a sort of one to both of you. Phyllis, I mean, you, you had that fantastic success, it, the closure of that uh, plant. What's, what's keeping you active now? What are you doing with your, um, with the CJGEA? What, what are your activities at this time? Um, so, we are working a lot with other environmental rights defenders. Um, after I was arrested, I've gone through numerous other threats. Um, I remember last year, there was a, in 20, no, 2017, uh, just after we had put up the class action suit in court, and there was pressure for us to remove it, um, there was a threat on my son that they were going to, pick, to kidnap my son. And uh, I managed to remove him from where we live to a different place. And unfortunately, one of my colleague's children was taken in his place. And uh, for days, we were hunting for him for almost three days. And so during the course of my work, I have had gunmen sent to, to my house to kill me. And I escaped miraculously. But this uh, has made me want to work with other environmental rights defenders. In 2015, I won the uh, Goldman Environmental Prize. And when uh, a few months later, one of my friends who we had won the, the prize at the same time, Bata Caceres, was shot and killed in her home, um, it woke me up to a lot that there were other environmental rights defenders, even in Kenya, that I could work with to help them, connect them with the people that had helped me, uh, share my experiences with them, and unite and try and help each other because we were actually advocating for the same thing. And so I work with the uh, uh, environmental rights defender from all the 47 counties in Kenya. And uh, we, work on, on, we work on building each other's capacity. We train each other. Like now, I think there's a training on digital security and, f security and physical security, <laughs> just trying to help each other stay alive. I mean, that's fantastic. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's, it's frightening, truly, to hear about the, the sort of the physical, physical aggression, the acts of violence, the murders that, that you've experienced. And so in the documenting, in the documenting that you do in these networks, mm -hmm. what do you do with that information? We have, uh, we have, we have been documenting uh, threats against environmental rights defenders in Kenya. And uh, we partnered with uh, other international organizations, and we put that publicly on the website. We have uh, used it in, uh, in, uh, to do the UPR report, the Universal Periodic Review, because Kenya is coming up in the UN. Uh, so we present these st statistics just to challenge uh, our human rights record as a country. Um, we also use this to make our uh, own selves, the environmental rights defenders in Kenya, aware of the threats mm. so that they can project what is coming, what might come, and they can just try to create space, uh, safer spaces within which they can nav navigate with, while doing their work. Global Witness um, already documented uh, killings from 2002 to 2017, uh, 1,558 environmental rights defenders. Uh, the first report they uh, launched was called, um, I think, Deadly Environment. And then they launched two other reports after that. And they documented that it doubled within those 15 years, the killings of environmental rights defenders. So it's, it's true um, uh, that we live in a very dangerous world. But also it's because what we advocate for is absolutely priceless. You cannot put a tag on a clean and healthy environment for humankind because uh, what environmental rights defenders are doing is actually trying to keep all of us alive. 
Well, there you go. So um, real and live threats there. And, and Carolo, you, we, we were just talking before we came on stage and you've just come uh, true to form by bus overnight from London. I flew and I'm guilty. Uh, she came by bus uh, where you were with Extinction Rebellion and that you faced some some difficulties, let's say, from the police there. Yeah, in fact, I, um, I came from London. I had met the movement of the Extinction Rebellion there a year ago when they were really, really very small. And um, so I thought that sounds interesting because it's not a climate movement. It's also a movement which addresses the underlying causes. And it's an ecological movement as well, which doesn't only ask for CO2 emissions to be reduced, but also for our general resource consumption to be uh, reduced, and also for a citizen assembly to be called in. So to general changes to our democracy, because I think many people feel that our democracies, even though are supposed to be representative, they really aren't because of all the lobby going on, and because of politicians often being on the pay list of various institutions and um, companies, so they're calling for a different type of democracy and giving more power back to the people because they say people who have their own interests and the interests of future generations in mind, they would take the better decisions. So yeah, I um, I have been just in London and it's um, it's quite interesting to observe such a type of movement which isn't organized structurally like an NGO, uh, but which has a lot of different groups, um, which take their autonomous decisions based on certain values. But also, um, the groups are individual, and some of the actions they do, I certainly agree with, and some of them I agree with less. So it's, um, it's very, very interesting to see that, but I really believe that looking at the environmental crisis we are in and looking at how many people have petitioned and campaigned and what's been going on in international negotiations. I unfortunately uh, have to agree that civil peaceful, civil disobedience at this point is absolutely necessary to wake up the uh, establishment and as, a, yeah, as citizens to take back um, more um, engagement or to get more engagement in our democratic processes because the systems as we have it are not working for the benefit of the people at all. No, I, I mean, thank you. Uh, but um, Phyllis, you, you mentioned something uh, you, that sort of caused me a bit of heartache, if I can be frank. You said, uh, you must pay a price for what you believe in to stand up for what's right. And, and you've described the price that you've paid and, and may well continue to pay. But when you hear Carola talk about um, civil disobedience and risk-taking, in, in that sense, what keeps you up at night? I mean, I'm, I'm asking that question in the sense that, for example, at MSF, we, we're witnessing a shift from organizational liability to our staff actually being criminalized for doing what they do as people. And, and this is almost, in my head, the reverse. This is people taking action, but somehow gaining, the day you became an activist, you somehow gained that protection from the community or uh, a force, a strength. Can you speak a little bit to that, the risk taking and, and being a person doing that? In a perfect world, um there, should be, there shouldn't be any risk for doing what is right. But unfortunately, this is where we are as, as humanity, as, uh, as a society. And uh, what, what keeps me at night is how to, uh, mostly just strategizing and thinking through, <laughs> thinking through um, how to navigate uh, safely in the world as it is today and yet being able to deliver what needs to be delivered. Because at the end of the day, what um, she has spoken uh, about um, has happened here in a developed world where we think uh, is a perfect world, where we think there is human rights and we should emulate, you know? 
but sharing, uh, listening to her, it seems they are just very sim similar situations to what is happening back home in Africa and in Kenya. And therefore, um, I believe that this is a time that we should actually stay up and, and, and think of how to join forces, okay? Join forces in terms of um, understanding how we can best complement each other, but get to what we want. Because at the end of the day, she's working for a better world. We are working for a better world. We are all working for the planet, for a better planet. And therefore, for me, what keeps me at night mostly is thinking about how best we can navigate uh, to do the work that we do, deliver what we need to deliver, uh, and not end up dead. <laughs> Quite literally. <laughs> and Ka Carola, same, same question. What keeps you up at night? Well, I, still, I still have to say that I think my... My life is really very easy, and when I hear of the threats that environmental defenders are faced with really on a daily basis, and because I also know these global witness reports, and I know how many people are threatened and killed, then I know that I'm still in an extremely fortunate position when I think of the people who are in, in Libya, for example, and who are trying to escape from this country of civil war. I'm really concerned about how we can change that narrative about the future, how we can take away the thought that people who are coming to Europe to seek shelter, how could we ever perceive them as a threat? You know, these people who need our protection most, how can we show, how can we convince everyone that they are worthy of our empathy and of our solidarity? And looking towards the future, I think it's urgently needed to create such a narrative because at the moment, really, we are a continent, a very rich continent, and a continent at peace, mainly, apart from maybe Ukraine and other areas. Um, but we are a continent at peace, and we have such horrible border policies. And what keeps me awake is really the question, how can we create a narrative to welcome people, because if we cannot do it now, how can we do it in the future when the environmental breakdown intensifies? That is my, my core question, which so far I haven't got any good answer to. I think, uh, yeah, be, 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 um, hopefully, hopefully after today and tomorrow, maybe there might be a few more answers. But yes, I hope it's so complex, but... Uh, uh, it seems clear what should be done, but whether that's actually everything, anything that's easily attainable tomorrow is, is the question, isn't it? Um, I'm also going to pick up on something you said, Phyllis, in your talk as well, a, a great thing you said. I, I'm not one to waste privilege, which, I, which also struck on me because, again, I, as I said, I feel guilty about flying here. And uh, what, what would you say to a room of, at the end of the day, undoubtedly privileged people who might be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, hopeful or spurred to action from your experiences? <laughs> too much or too little? Uh, too much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a beautiful continent, this one. Um, <laughs> uh, I've seen beautiful cars on the roads, yeah? I've, I've used the train, uh, the tram, and it's amazing. And my, what kept on running into my head is, do these people know where their batteries come from? Um, and so as we enjoy the environment and the privilege that we have, um, I, 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 my call would be that we try and, if we can't do much, ask some questions that needed to, need to be asked, because governments will not do it, corporations will not do it, but we, the people, will do it. When you go to purchase your battery and you try to find out what happens at the end of life of your battery, is it shipped to Africa, 
to poison Phyllis and her community? Or is it disposed of in a good way and recycled in a good way that protects and preserves nature for all of us? I think that will be a great start for all of us. And not just for Beatrice, but for everything that we do. Um, so proud of her that she chose to, <laughs> to come by road. Little things that, um, we, that is uh, paying the price, you know, to achieve what we all want, which is um, safety for all of us. We don't want also to be leaving home, to be running here, because our homes are polluted. We want to stay home. We want our rivers to flow. We want our farms to produce as they used to. We want our children to, to eat from the fruit trees as they used to. Um, and this is what will keep us home and make us happy. And so we keep each other safe. We keep each other happy. Thank you. I think we'll end it on that note there because that sounds like a, a lovely prayer for us all to think about this evening and uh, how to spur us on in all our personal actions. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Phyllis, for coming. Thank you, Carola. Thank you, those at home. Let's do a stand-up, shall we? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.